Hey everyone, in today's video, I'm going to share three different math practices we should stop doing now and what to try instead. Now, I think it was the last month I came out with a similar type video, but with literacy practices for a K through two classroom. So after you finish this one, if you wanna check that one out, it is a fun one. But after that one was published, I got a few comments and emails asking me to do something similar with K through two math. So here we are. If you are ready to hear these three different practices, you should stop now and and figure out what to do instead, give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, let's get started. The first math practice we are going to want to stop in our classroom is focusing on the answer. Now that might sound a little crazy because yes, in math, most of the time there's only one correct answer. But what happens is if we focus too much time on just the answer and just getting it right, and we don't spend enough time talking about the process, then students are going to miss things along the way. They're not going to develop that real math understanding as they continue to higher grades. Math in real life isn't, hey Bob, what's three plus four? Like that's not a realistic thing that happens in life, but there are many sort of more difficult, more nuanced math problems that we do solve on a daily basis. Since the math problems we solve in our real life situations are, you know, more convoluted, more difficult than some simple equations written on a board, we do want students to take the time to be able to explain their processes and figure out different ways to solve a problem. Because realistically, whether a student gets the right answer or the wrong answer, there is a whole lot to learn by thinking about their process and by learning more about their process to which they got that answer. This tip of not focusing on getting the right answer is not just for you, the teacher, because it's important too that you aren't spending too much time just focusing on did they get the right answer, the wrong answer. You know, that's why we have students show their work and explain their process below. Um, usually on like a worksheet or something, but we also want to make sure that students are aware that even if they get the wrong answer, we can walk through their process to figure out how to get the right one. So we also don't want our students to think that the only, you know, thing they need to do is just get the right answer. Okay, sounds simple enough, but what can we do to go about doing that? What types of practices can we put into our classroom in our math block to make sure that we have students focusing on the process? First and foremost, you're always going to want to check in with yourself and make sure you are modeling these expectations. So when you are teaching students something or you're modeling something in front of the classroom, don't just show them one way to get the right answer. Ask if students can come up with another way or show them another way to get the answer. Implementing math talks on a regular basis is going to be very important and is a highly successful tool to getting students to think about and talk about all the different processes when it comes to solving equations. If you pose a question to the class and a student raises their hand and gives you the wrong answer, instead of telling them that it's wrong, ask them to walk you through it and record every step that they tell you. Don't stop them, don't interrupt them, have them walk you through the process and then we can analyze it. There's so much value in having students be able to look at their process and say, wait a second, look at that step right there. This is where I made a mistake, right? This is where I can go back and I can fix this to get the right answer. We also know that there's a lot of anxiety around math in students of all ages. And a lot of that anxiety comes from, you know, getting the wrong or getting the right answer. And if they have the wrong answer and they don't know how to solve it, what are they going to do? They don't wanna share their thoughts. But instead, if we can get students to recognize that even if I don't have the answer yet, or I came up with this answer and I'm not sure if it's right, if we can get them comfortable expressing their process and expressing the steps that they took, then that is great. We get so much insight into what they're doing and how we can help them. And that way they don't have to feel, you know, any shame around getting the wrong answer either. Instead, they know that they can go to their teacher, they can go to the class and their classmates to figure out the right answer. Math practice number two to stop doing in your classroom is viewing math as a solo activity. Oftentimes math is seen as a pretty independent activity, even though the teacher will, you know, model how to do something and then maybe we'll all do it as a group and kind of walk through it together. Um, and then they kind of go off and do it independently. The goal is for them to be able to solve these problems on their own without a partner there. But we do want to emphasize how important that partner can really be. 
And I don't mean just like playing a partner math game with someone, I, you know I love math games, but that's not what I mean in this scenario. Instead of having your students view themselves as solo mathematicians, we want them to realize that their whole class is a group of mathematicians and that we can all really learn from one another. Now doing something like those number talks I talked about in number one is a great way for students to see that because they can listen to their peers, they can see their explanations and learn from one another. But I also love having students use math partners in a different way. One of my favorite ways to use math partners is to actually go ahead and pose a question to the class just like you would for a math talk whole group. But what you're going to do is you're going to give students a little bit of time to solve it independently and they will want a piece of paper or a whiteboard, something where again they have to show their work, not just the answer. So they will go ahead and solve the problem and then when that time is up you're going to have them meet with a math partner. When they get together with their partner they are going to share their answers and how they got it. Remember, not just the answer, the process. And then their partner is going to say if they agree or disagree and why. And they're going to show if they got the answer in a separate way. And that partner is going to say if they agree or disagree with the answer or with the process, any part that they want to agree or disagree with, they can go ahead and do that during this time. And then on top of that, they're going to take it one step further and they have to try to express how their partner solved the problem. So especially if it's different from the way they did it, this is where they're going to really learn from their partner and find a new strategy or a new way to solve that problem. So after students have solved the problem, gotten together with their partner to share how they got the problem, agree, disagree, and they've had to go ahead and express how their partner solved it in their own words, I then have the class come together as a whole group one last time. When we come together, I like to call on one or two students and they have to share how their partner solved the problem. And then after they've gone ahead and explained it, I'll ask that partner, how do you think your partner did? Would you add anything to that, change anything? And again, we all learn from one another. What I love about an activity like this is that our students can really lean on one another as mathematicians instead of always just leaning on me. And if you get into this rhythm and routine, if students come across a difficult problem or they don't know how to solve something, and let's pretend I'm with a small group in the back, they don't need to come to me. They could maybe go to their specific math partner. If you change them up each day, they can go to someone else in the class and learn from them. And math practice number three to stop doing in your classroom is moving to algorithms too quickly. Now I understand it is so tempting, especially when you're in first and second grade, to just teach those students how to solve the standard algorithm, how to line up the numbers, carry the one, etc. But there are actually so many problems that can happen when solving that standard algorithm that while it may seem like the simplest way to teach them how to do it and students may seem to get it pretty quickly, the understanding of what's actually happening is often lost on our students. Now I talked a little bit about this in my double digit addition and subtraction video, but there are many other ways that you can teach students how to solve double digit addition and subtraction problems without using the standard algorithm. And these ways are what you should do first before even introducing that algorithm. As we're talking about our process and why that's so important, sometimes students will actually come up with completely unreasonable answers using the algorithm because of a simple mistake that they made. Let's say they carried the one in the wrong column or they forgot to carry the one. And now, you know, they're adding a double digit number and somehow the sum is like way smaller or way larger than it could possibly be if they had any sort of number sense understanding of what the numbers show. This happens all the time because students get so focused on just solving the process of the algorithm that they're not really taking into account what they're doing and the number sense behind it all. So what can we do instead of just jumping to that algorithm? We really need to slow it down, break down that process, have students show these answers using manipulatives, have them explain it, have them explain the way their neighbor did, have them come up with other ways to solve the problem before just moving them to that algorithm. And you'll probably get a little pushback. Some of your students might even say, well, I got the right answer, so what's the big deal? Why do I need to show this using, you know, cubes or show this using a picture when I know how to do this? Well, yes, I understand. That's great when you get the right answer, but when you get the wrong answer, can we identify why that is? Not just, oh, I put the one in the wrong column here, what does that one mean? Why, when you put it in the wrong column, did you get a way different answer? Did you even notice that you got 
less of an answer even though you're adding two numbers together. All of these things are really important to build in our students' mathematical reasoning. Some ways to slow this down, like I said, are using manipulatives, using images, doing something like having the partners work together, like I shared in my last tip, where students are still solving those same types of problems, but they're showing each other different ways to do that. And then of course I love the partial sums and partial differences algorithm, which is something I shared in my double digit addition and subtraction video, but it's a nice scaffolded step that emphasizes place value before your students get to the standard algorithm. All right, so those are my three different math practices that you should stop doing now and some ideas for what to try instead. Now for some of you, those may have been relatively simple and just some reminders about some good practices you already do now. Some of those you may have reflected a little bit and been like, wait a second, maybe I do jump to that standard algorithm a little too quickly, or maybe I don't have my students work in pairs enough. But either way, I hope this video gave you some ideas and some practices to use in your K through two math classroom. As always, I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video. See you in the next one. Bye.